What's up, Packer fans? Happy Thursday. Welcome into the Pack-A-Day podcast. I'm your host, Andy Herman. You can follow me on Twitter at Andy Herman NFL. Don't necessarily have a main topic, so to speak, lined up for you today. Uh, more of, you know, kind of a news and notes sort of thing. Just kind of some interesting stuff that we found out over the course of the last 24 hours or so. Um, and just kind of going to break down each of them one by one. And I think maybe the most important one of those is the Packers restructuring Dean Lowry, uh, which does a couple things. First of all, it saves about $2.5 million in, in salary cap this season, which will help them get towards the ability to to finalize their draft class, sign a practice squad this upcoming season. Um, but it's not quite there to have the flexibility and ability to actually sign players in season. Every time I go over this, I mention this, but it's worth noting. Um, when you place a player on IR in season, they go on IR, they still count against your salary cap. Then when you sign a new player to take their place, that person goes on your salary cap as well. So some people have this nifty idea that you just have to pay your top 53 guys and then everything else just kind of works itself out. It's not that way at all. Um, when you consider practice squad and injured reserve and all those sort of things, pup list and whatever else players end up on through the course of the season, you might end up with 75, 80, 85 guys in total on your payroll through the course of the season. So that adds up quickly and you have to have some measure of flexibility to be able to sign those players and make those sort of moves in season um, so that you're not caught with the ability to have to, or the need to restructure players in season just so you can go and sign Sign your 53rd guy to your roster when you actually need him in season. So they've done a good job in, in getting to this point with keeping their roster mainly intact, quarterback position pending, uh, but they've done a good job of that. But uh, it's definitely a situation where it's not completely resolved yet. Also um, of note here, I think if you would have asked just about anyone and certainly myself, and I'll be the first to admit, I, I completely misread this offseason and what they were going to do with free agents. Definitely thought Preston Smith and Dean Lowry were going to be two of the guys that would not be back and that they would uh, look to kind of save some cap space that way. Did not think there was a real great chance that Aaron Jones would be back. Like, I just thought they were going to different directions. Kevin King is another one. I didn't think there was any chance, at least a very slight chance that Kevin King would be back. So, those are players that I thought they'd potentially move on from to either make it so that they're not insanely over the cap next year or potentially to actually be able to sign some free agents this year, which we know that they've completely avoided up until this point, save for Blake Bortles, of course, uh, but outside of Blake Bortles, which is still such a crazy thing to say, uh, they have not ventured into free agency. So I think that was not something that I necessarily expected, but with Dean Lowry on the roster and them kind of keeping things intact this year. Um, the two names that we have not seen restructure, the two names that I certainly thought would be at the top of that list at the beginning of the year, Aaron Rodgers and Devontae Adams. Now we know the whole Rodgers situation. Devontae Adams is another one. And as I kind of mentioned yesterday, I want to get to that in one of these videos coming up, but I'm still very, very surprised that Devontae Adams is in the situation as well that he is in we don't know exactly what that quote unquote situation is. There may not be a situation at all. He may just want to come back and play out this season at his deal right now, but certainly interesting that he's not in camp uh, right now. Uh, certainly interesting that he's giving up some of that money uh, to, you know, that he's not at practices to not be there right now. Uh, certainly some of his comments were interesting about what happens with Aaron Rodgers and how that could potentially affect him. And Again, I think the big thing is he's not he's going to be 30 in not very long and is on the last year of his deal and Green Bay is in a really really tight situation with salary cap moving forward. It's it's a really really interesting scenario that again needs its its full episode to break down, but they've went out of their way at this point to restructure everyone else. The two that have an Aaron Rodgers, which again we know that there's a lot of extenuating circumstances there. And the other one's Devontae Adams. They will likely have to do something with one of them in order to do those things that I mentioned. There's a couple other ways that they could potentially get just under enough. Some of the players that they release um, at cutdowns when they go from 51 to 53 on the uh, counting against the cap, what happens is you usually end up cutting some players that, let's say they're making 870,000 or 900,000, 950,000, some of those sort of players. And then you end up with a player on the roster who's only making like the minimum, which is like 660,000. Well, you end up with enough of those and all 
of a sudden you're getting a, a million, million and a half here and there that can add some additional space to that, not to get too far into the weeds here, but there are some other things that they can do um, to still do this, but I would be very surprised if something doesn't happen. Something's going to happen with Aaron Rodgers one way or the other. We know that, but I'd be very surprised if something doesn't happen, period, with one of those. It basically has to. So um, still more to come there. The other big noteworthy piece that kind of goes alongside of this, at least down the road a little bit, is the the NFL and the NFL Players Association have agreed that the salary cap ceiling in 2022 will be 208.2 million. That means no matter what happens, the cap will be at most 208.2 million next year. And if it go if they have more money above that, it'll take some of the costs that were offset in 2020 so that they don't have to continue to push this down the road and can hopefully get back to where a normal salary cap would be sooner rather than later, but they are going to limit it as a ceiling of 208.2. Now that doesn't even mean that it will get to 208.2. This could easily still be a cap that ends up around 200, 205, 200, you know, whatever million. Doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to get to 208.2, but it will not go over 208.2 million. Why does that matter? Well, the Packers, as we sit here today, are already at 237 million in costs in 2022 at minimum. Like there's still more to come, and as potential stuff happens with Devontae and Rodgers, that could change very quickly as well. If you thought 2021 uh, was, uh, you know, Brian Gutekunst doing some salary cap gymnastics, 2022 is going to be that to even a much larger extent. And if you're hoping that in future, you know, upcoming future years, that Green Bay is going to be able to have the flexibility to be a player in free agency, that is not going to happen. This core of this roster right now, they'll be able to keep some guys that they want. If they want to keep a Devontae Adams, they'll be able to do some of the things like that. But the core of their roster right now is what it's going to be for the next few seasons. And of course, they'll still have draft picks and things like that. But your Jair Alexanders, your Aaron Jones, your potentially Devontae Adams, if they can get a deal done, we'll see what happens with Aaron Rodgers, David Bakhtiari, Kenny Clark, like those core players are going to be the core players moving forward. They're not going to be able to bring in more of those. And there's going to be some serious cap casualties coming in the next couple of years. Because again, the highest that salary cap is going to be 208.2 and the Packers already at 237. I haven't looked at it, but my guess is that's nowhere near a, a full 53 man roster going into next year, but we'll see. And it's definitely going to be something that is going to be on the the back burner coming up. And again, all of the Aaron Rodgers stuff that's going on, it plays a part in this too, right? If they do end up trading them post June 1st this year, that helps a lot of that, you know, kind of work itself out. They trade them and they get back a quarterback who's making the same amount of money. Not so much. Uh, so there's just a million different things at play here that could change this. But we know now that a 208.2 million salary cap is the highest it could possibly be, possibly be um, which even if it gets to that point, Green Bay will have some struggles. Other news and notes, Aaron Rodgers and Tom Brady will be officially facing off again July 6th. They will be on the latest version of the match. It'll be Phil Mickelson and Tom Brady taking on Bryson DeChambeau and Aaron Rodgers. I know nothing, next to nothing about golf, so I'm not going to comment too far here. I am definitely going to be out of my element, uh, but the biggest thing here that you need to know is the meme game has been absolutely legit so far, specifically from Tom Brady. Tom Brady is winning this, uh, unfortunately, once again, uh, but Rogers had a great Star Wars video to respond to things. He posted an Anchorman uh, gif, so th there's definitely some really good back and forth, and the golfers are getting involved as well, so uh, really, really fun stuff, and I think that's definitely, you know, even if you're not a huge golf person, I think that's just one of those where should be very entertaining uh, to watch Brady and Rogers as well as DeChambeau and Mickelson as well. So that should be a fun event. Um, another small noteworthy thing is uh, the, the Packers defensive coaches and, and uh, Marie Strait and the special teams coach as well uh, did interviews on Wednesday. Not a ton of takeaways, but uh, one of the, I guess, semi noteworthy pieces was Jerry Gray mentioning that they have five players potentially in mind who could play that nickel star position. And without going too far in depth as to what that star position is. I mean, Jalen Ramsey played a lot of it for the Rams last year. And to me, the ultimate star slot player to have, who have ever played this game was Charles Woodson during his time in Green Bay. And think of it this way. It's almost like a safety corner, slot corner, and even some semi-pseudo outside linebacker 
hybrid that's playing in this role. And this isn't anything new, right? This is ideally what you would want. I mean, yes, who wouldn't want Charles Woodson or Jalen Ramsey playing in the slot, right? Somebody that has that sort of size, that sort of foot quickness, playmaking ability, the ability to cover down the field, the ability to move back and play safety in a, if, or, you know, in a cover three situation, cover four situation. Like, it, those are ideal players. That's what you're looking for there. And why do you want that? Well, of course you want the peer coverage ability because you could be asked to cover down the field at any time. Ball skills, always important as a defensive back. The foot's quickness. So if you go against uh, you know, one of those shiftier slot wide receivers, think you're Julian Edelman's, Wes Welker's, things like that, that you have the ability to stick with the shiftiness of those players. Um, why the size? Well, we've now seen the bigger slot you know, players, right? Whether it's a tight end, whether it's a wide receiver, we now see some of the 6'3", 6'4", 6'5", guys playing in the slot. They have the, you know, the Jalen Ramseys, the Charles Woodson, they have the ability to match up one-on-one with those sort of players as well. They don't have to bring somebody else in that role. And then also, as I mentioned, kind of that pseudo outside linebacker, the ability to one blitz off the edge. If you want to, you know, have somebody scream off the edge. And if all of a sudden an offensive tackle or running back picks, picks them up, do you have any sort of move set or just pure quickness to get around that player? And then lastly, the ability to set the edge as well. A lot of times if you are, you know, f- you know, four defensive linemen or two defensive linemen and two outside linebackers, depending on what front you're playing, maybe two linebackers or a linebacker and a safety right behind them, basically your normal six man box, you know, that that corner, that slot corner, that star player is almost like the the third player in a four three, right? It's almost like that weak side outside linebacker. Or if you're in a three four, it's almost like you've got, you know, three defensive linemen with and then the other outside linebacker you know, kicking out as almost like the, the the true outside linebacker in a three four with like your Charles Ramsey Ramsey Charles Woodson or Jalen Ramsey playing like the other almost like an outside linebacker in a three four and then you've got your one outside linebacker and your other linebacker kicking inside as like your inside linebackers in a three four so that player almost kicks in as either a weak side linebacker in a four three or as another outside linebacker in a three four. And again, if you're a Jalen Ramsey or you're a Charles Woodson, you have that size and ability to set the edge. It is a huge benefit. You're basically an amoeba that can go from a nickel defense to a 3-4 or a 4-3 at any given moment because of the versatility of that player. So it's probably a little bit deeper than I wanted to get into it, but those are the ideal type of star players. Now, 99.9% 99.9% of teams in the history of football don't have a Jalen Ramsey or Charles Woodson. So you're not going to get all those things that I just said, but you want as many as you can. If I had to guess the five players that I think could be in contention here for this star position, Jair Alexander, Chandon Sullivan, Eric Stokes, Shamar Jean Charles, and Darnell Savage, those would be my guess. Now, it is very possible that maybe they are not even including Gene Charles or Eric Stokes in this conversation because they just want to develop them as players and they'll figure that stuff out later. It could be that a Will Redmond is in that conversation. That's within the realm of possibility. It could be that a Josh Jackson is there. I don't think that's his best position. I think he's very much struggled in the slot, but the ball skills, the size, some of those things, the ability to play zone defense, the, you know, all those things could be in the mixture there. Maybe a Kadar Hallman. I don't necessarily see that either just because the size isn't there. Really, we don't know if he can meet any of those thresholds at this point. But those are some players that could be in the conversation. But Jair Alexander, of course, has the tenacity, has the coverage, the foot quickness, can get back in zone, can play man. Not necessarily the biggest guy, but he's so scrappy and he's just a dog at that slot, you know, at that corner position where he's willing to come up and make a play. But you're taking your best cover corner away. So I don't think it'll end up being him, but he can definitely play there if you wanted him to. Um, Chandon Sullivan is probably the leader in the clubhouse, has a little bit of size, and he's a good run defender, can set the edge a little bit in those situations. Does he have the foot quickness? Does he have the man-to-man coverage? He can drop back in his zone. He's got okay ball skills. Probably meets more of that than we think, but probably not any of it at a very high level. Eric Stokes, again, still developing. We'll see what he ends up being. I still think he's ideally an outside corner. I don't think he is a perfect fit in the slot, but I think Green Bay may just want to get their best corners out on the field. We'll see. I don't expect it to be Stokes. Gene Charles is a ideal, well, his best position, I should say, is probably a slot corner. Does he meet all of those criteria? No, he doesn't. Uh, but he's an interesting player with a high football IQ who has some ball skills um, and has some foot quickness in and out of breaks. So 
He could be somebody that plays there. And then Darnell Savage, another one that makes some sense. I don't think he has the pure coverage skills, but I have a feeling Green Bay is going to play a lot of zone. He can get back and play that safety. He is aggressive against the, you know, against the run and in the run game. Um, I think that could make a lot of sense. If I was a betting man today, I would say Chandon Sullivan uh, would probably end up being the guy with Darnell Savage sprinkled in, but a lot of time left to kind of figure that out. But they said five guys in the mix. Those would be my guess. Again, maybe a Redmond, a Holloman, a Josh Jackson could get involved as well. But um, I'm expecting Shannon Sullivan and Darnell Savage to maybe be the leaders in the clubhouse there. Last but not least, Green Bay did sign a wide receiver, probably because most of their wide receivers are not there right now. They signed DeAndre Tompkins of Washington Defenders fame of the XFL or AA, I forget which, I think it was the XFL. Um, too many weird leagues that have happened over the last few seasons to keep track of which, but I believe it was the Washington Defenders of the XFL. Um, but uh, he played there for a while, played for Penn State, um, and we'll give them some, some depth right now while most of the receivers are not in camp for whatever reason. That's going to do it for me. Uh, make sure to follow if you have not already and subscribe. Uh, make sure to check out today's audio podcast wherever you get your favorite podcast, Jacob Westendorf, Jimmy Christensen, Maggie Loney. So great crew today. Make sure to check that out. I'll be right back here tomorrow, but until next time, and as always, go Pack Go.